This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to the online worship of Black Mountain Presbyterian Church, and we are so grateful that you are with us. If you would like to follow along in our worship this morning, please go to our website at bmpcnc.org. And if you scroll down on the homepage, you will see our bulletin for October 25th. I am so very pleased to announce the results of our first ever distance congregational meeting for the election of our officers. No nominations from the floor were received by our clerk. Therefore, it was an, an un uncontested election. We had 96 electronic votes, and some of those were for two people and four paper ballot votes, and all of our officers were unanimously elected. Please keep them in prayer in the year ahead. Thanks once again for your participation in this important process of electing the leadership for our church. Friends, if you would like to attend our Vesper service this evening at 630, you will find a place to sign up on the homepage of our website or on our Facebook page. We look forward to announcing our new members in worship next Sunday, November 1st when we celebrate All Saints Sunday here at Black Mountain Presbyterian. This Sunday, we are kicking off our Pathways to Fearless Generosity campaign. I ask you to please not fast forward through the minute for mission. Take a few minutes to watch, to listen, and to learn about what's different this year. So I am here with Dave Johnson, who is a member of our session and chair of our generosity team and we're going to explain to everyone how things are a little bit different this year with our generosity campaign i'm going to interview dave so how is the process for the annual campaign going to be different this year dave well first of all thanks for having me mary catherine and good morning to everybody i think there is a lot of similarity in what we're going to be doing because it's going to build on what we've done the last two years if you recall, two years ago, we had the dinner at Montreat. Last year, we had the small group dinners and discussions. And in those, we tried to give people an opportunity to think about and talk about generosity. And we had a lot of good discussions in those, I think. This year, we're going to use a process called the Pathways to Generosity. And we've actually adapted that theme a little bit to include our, our word fearless that was in our theme originally this year. So what you'll hear is Pathways to Fearless Generosity as our campaign for this year. And I think it's an opportunity for each of us to give more thought and to give prayer to how we give and how we're generous to the church. So it's going to be more of a spiritual journey that we'll all take together. That, that certainly is one of the differences you'll see this year. You'll, there'll be a lot more emphasis on that, yes. Okay, and so what will be some of the steps that we'll take in the process of uh, Pathways to Fearless Generosity? Sure. Over, over the next four weeks, you will see a number of things. You'll see inspirational stories from church members, from community members, uh, to help us understand what, we're, what impact we're having with our generosity. You'll see us using small groups within the church. We call them affinity groups, things, groups like the Presbyterian Women's Group and others, for, for similar discussions, again, to get people thinking and talking and praying about generosity. And then finally, there'll be a whole devotional process that you'll see on a daily basis for the next four weeks, and that helps us consider what God's plan is for our generosity. And because of these things, we'd like everybody, all of us, to experience some of this before we put in an estimate of giving for this year. So that's one reason why we've delayed the process a little bit. As you recall, we usually have it in October. We're going to be doing it in November. And we really are asking you to wait a couple of weeks into November before you think about that estimate of giving. And again, as we've said in other communications, there will be three ways you can complete that estimate of giving. First is online through the church website. Second, there will be an opportunity to pick up packets at the church. We'll have two volunteers here on Sunday, November 8th, and Wednesday, November 11th, for you to pick up a package if you want to drive by and get that. Or for those who can't do either, we will be mailing the packets a little bit after that. So that's the kind of steps within the process for us. So, um, so I heard that So we're not going to be calling them pledge cards anymore. We're going to be calling them estimate of giving cards. That's a little different. And um, what, what kind of key questions are we going to be answering in this process? 
Well, there are really two keys, and they're both why questions. And, and they seem on the surface maybe to be very straightforward, and you, you'd think they're obvious questions. But as you think about them, they really can get very deep for you. First one is, why should I be generous? Just in general. Why should I give anything to anyone else in the community, to the church, anyone else? The second question is, why do I give to my church? Why do I give to Black Mountain Presbyterian Church? And that's really an important question. And we hope to have, and we will have, responses from members of the congregation that will help us answer those questions and will help provide you, as you think about those questions, some other things that people have said about why they do it. Why do they pledge to, or why do they give to the church? Why are they generous to the church? So you'll, you'll see some of that during, during the campaign and that should help you to think about it on your own. Well, I look forward to hearing those stories. Um, I understand that uh, something that's going to be different is we're going to be following this giving path. Can you explain what the, the giving path is? Sure, and you'll, you'll hear more about that during the process in the month of November, but basically there are five steps in this process, and it just helps you understand where you are in the process of being generous. The first step is you might be just starting to give. You may not have been able to, you may not have been in a position to give in the past, and maybe you're considering doing it this year. So you might be on that first step of just considering starting to give. Then there are people who are regular givers, who give essentially the same sort of gift each year, and that, that's very much appreciated. The third step is people who are able and willing that this year to increase their giving. And that can be a small amount, a large amount, any amount is, is appreciated. The fourth step is people who are, have the opportunity and the resources to be able to tithe to the church. And, and we really do appreciate that, the, those sorts of gifts. And then finally, we may have some people who can go even beyond the tithe. And that would be incredible if we get some Extravagant, right? Uh, well, uh, very generous, I would <laughs> yes, say. Yeah. But what we want you to do is find the right place for you. There's no right, one right place for everybody. Uh, if you're just starting to give, that's perfectly fine. We're very grateful for that. If you're at the place where you can increase your giving or maybe even consider a tithe, that's also greatly appreciated. And really what we're asking you to do is challenge yourself to find your place on this path and talk to God and ask, see where God is calling you to be on this path. So it sounds like you can be fearless at any place on this path. You sure can. Right, and, and at you, any You can step. be fearless in beginning that process. You can be fearless in moving to a new place on the process. Both of those take that fearlessness. Well, so any final thoughts for our congregation? Well, yeah, just one. The, the, the financial aspect of a campaign it is clear and is very important to us. But as we've done in the past couple of years, I want to emphasize again, it's not just the financial contributions that help the church and its ministries. It's your time. It's your talent. It's how you give of yourself. And we, I think that that can make a difference in our community, and it can make a difference in our world, and we really do appreciate it. Well, thanks to Dave Johnson and our whole team for bringing us this wonderful ministry today. Thank you. Thank you. On this new morning and every morning of our lives, gracious God, from generation to generation, we praise your holy name. Like our ancestors before us, we proclaim your greatness to our children. For we have seen your deeds of power and witnessed your goodness in our lives. As you have opened your hand to all, satisfying the desire of every living thing, open our hearts so that we might share the gifts we have received from you. Let us worship God in gratitude and joy.
The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. God of Abraham, God of Moses, you promised to set us free from paths of fear, doubt, and denial. Yet we resist your invitation, seeing only what we must give up if we are to follow your path. You call us to have faith in your sustaining presence and power, but your call takes us beyond anything we can see or touch. We fear placing our trust in things beyond our control. We doubt that you can bring water to the dry places of our lives or replace our suffering with joy. Forgive us when we turn away from your promise of abundant life. Heal us and lead us home, Holy One. Amen. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Good morning, children. So this time of year is a time of year of harvest. As those leaves change and as we bring in pumpkins and gourds and squash and finish up our corn and potatoes, it is a wonderful time of year to eat well and to share the wealth. And that's why we always think about sharing this time of year as we move in to the holiday season of Thanksgiving and we move towards Christmas. It is such a time of giving, and this is something that grows right out of Christianity and out of the town and the people around us, that it is a time for giving and sharing. So last year, we gave piggy banks out, and these piggy banks helped you to practice your giving. Now, I don't know if you have yours, but maybe you can go and find that after we talk. I think I have one here somewhere. Let me see. Let's see. Wait a minute. Oh, these are socks. Not that. Hold on. A mask? No. Ah, here it is. So this is my piggy bank. It's like yours. And it has the four parts. One is for saving, and that is to save and just keep in there and not, not take out. Another is for spending, and that is for things you may need, like you probably need something warm to wear this year. You may need a new hat or gloves. And then to donate. That would be for giving right away, to give as we... Go and keep filling it and giving. And the final one is to invest in a long, long view of things you may need in the future, maybe for school and maybe for a rainy day when there's another need. But I'd love for you to get these out and start to practice using them at home. Maybe put them on the kitchen table or nearby where everyone can participate with you and share the wealth that we all have. It's a time for giving, and giving changes us. It makes us better it makes us feel better, and it makes everyone around us appreciate the gift you give. So, the season of giving begins. Let's jump right in. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word in the book of Exodus, 
Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Merciful God, teach us to be faithful in every time of change and uncertainty, that trusting in your word and obeying your will, we may enter the unfailing joy of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from the third chapter of Exodus, verses 1 through 15. Listen now for the word of God. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said to Moses, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this, God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A burning bush, a wilderness landscape, a complacent follower, a mysterious God whose face cannot be seen. I'll be the first to admit that the burning bush call of Moses seems like a misplaced text as wildfires continue to rage in California. It seems a little too close to home to be talking about wilderness as the Gulf coastline has been forever changed by not one, but two hurricanes. When we were planning our Genesis and Exodus worship this past summer, 
Our worship team had no idea how these texts would be in dialogue with our state of the world. Even as we look to December and prepare for being a scattered church in Advent, it is hard to imagine how it will feel to read those apocalyptic texts of that season too. What will our world look like then? Our text today tells us that Moses was herding sheep in his new strange life years after growing up as the Pharaoh's family scandal. A Hebrew boy brought in by Pharaoh's daughter in defiance of Pharaoh's orders was one of the sole survivors of his slaughtered generation. He was probably fairer skinned than his Hebrew siblings, having been spared the hard slave labor in the sun, and he probably had a soft belly from a palace upbringing. He was never at home in the palace, though, being the open secret of Egypt. Yet he was not at home in the sparse Hebrew dwellings either. He did not know hard labor like them. He did not sing their songs or know their names. Indeed, in a fit of passion, he had killed an abusive Egyptian taskmaster on behalf of his people, and they still rejected him, fearing his power and doubting his loyalty. So as we read and interpret the beginning chapters of Exodus, perhaps we can understand somewhat the aimlessness of Moses. I mean, there have been days during this COVID crisis where many of us have not had a clear sense of purpose, where it's hard to make sense of old familiar patterns and traditions that don't seem to fit into our well-made plans anymore. We get it. We understand Moses's aimlessness, don't we? There's too much trauma in the world and, you know, it would be easier to run away and shepherd sheep, right? Having not belonged in the role of the oppressive party for some time and not finding home in the suffering segment, Moses is out in the desert, living out a Midianite marriage. His days blurring together as one continuous blob until he saw that bush on fire. That is the day that everything changed for Moses. There's a famous poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning that suggests that every bush can be a burning bush if we have eyes to see. She writes, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush of fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. I love this sentiment that holy ground is everywhere, that in the most ordinary of times and places, God can call out to us illuminating the room, giving us a purpose and a mission. The promise is always there, but do we have eyes to see it? I'm curious, why was this the day? Why was this a day that Moses happened to see and God happened to call? With no offense to Browning, it was only when Moses was beyond the wilderness that he saw this bush. Some translations say at the far side or the edge of the wilderness. He was not in his backyard or by the local well. He had journeyed far out into the land to the limits of where he could take his sheep. And I wonder, if by beyond the wilderness, the teller of the story is also trying to say that Moses was maybe at the end of his rope, at his wit's end. His life had not always been the boring life of a sheep herder after all, but now he was in exile from his family and on the run from the Egyptians. 
There's a bit of breathlessness to this moment, a weariness to his face. It is not just a casual day in the life of Moses. I mean, we know the story of the burning bush. God told Moses to take his sandals off off because it was holy ground. But perhaps it was also a signal to Moses that he had finally found his home. Because if you think about it, where else do you take off your shoes? His home, it turned out, was not the cool rooms of the palace or the sparse village of the Hebrew people. It was the wilderness. It was the very presence of God. And then, of course, God told Moses that God was not like the deities of empire whose egos needed to be stroked and whose bloodlust was as normal as the rising sun. No, God had heard the cries of the suffering and God was going to do something drastic, something world upheaving to liberate God's people. And God, God was going to partner with Moses choosing to risk this whole liberation enterprise on a fragile, fickle sheep herder. And Moses, Moses isn't sold. He responds with the big faith questions, questions that we may first go over with confirmants who are buzzing around in their minds the same type of theological questions. Who am I? And by the way, God, who are you? Remember, Moses didn't grow up hearing the stories that his brother and sister did. But as his callous toes gripped the sand beneath his feet, there was another grounding taking place. This was the same ground from which God breathed humanity into life. Moses may not have contained the memory, but the earth beneath his feet did. And God reminded him that there is an ancient memory, an ancestral belonging in which he was being planted like a tree or perhaps even a bush. And this voice, this voice was of the God of Moses' father, of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. You may not know these stories, God seemed to be saying, but they are yours, Moses. This is who you are. This memory that existed outside of Moses was important because God's call was not just to free a little band of enslaved people as an escape from empire, though that was important enough, especially if you were part of that little band. Rather, God was assaulting the consciousness of empire itself, that binary world that shaped Moses' imagination the mythic pretensions that oppression is necessary for human flourishing, that one must eat or be eaten. But from this bush beyond the wilderness, God was asking Moses to imagine a different world. God was asking, what if things could be different? What if things didn't have to be this way? This is a God who chose something as trivial as a bush on which to burn. Yet even this bush was preserved with care and the flames not consuming and reducing it to ashes. This is a God whose plan was not to strong arm and subjugate, but rather to lead out and liberate Imagine a different world, God proposes, where my people are free, where the Hebrew people do not exist as capital and collateral, but live in what will be a covenant community. 
One thing that we know is that the call beyond the wilderness after years of ancestral homelessness, that this call will never be comfortable. Moses' shoes may be off, but he isn't sipping tea and reading a book by the fire. The story of his people was coursing through his body in the call of God to partner in the work of deliverance, a dangerous call, one that could alienate and even kill him. But in the recitation of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God seemed to be saying to Moses, your people have done this work before. You are not alone. You are not the first and you will not be the last. I am goes with you. And even as Moses continues to question, God reminds Moses of the gifts of his brother. That is to which to come, the Aaron, the gifts of Aaron. God says, Moses, you will never be alone. Now, I have said many times over the past few months that we find ourselves in a liminal space or threshold season as a church. It must have been how Martin Luther and the other reformers felt over 500 years ago as the old ways of being church began to unravel and a new type of church emerged. I am reminded of the wise words of Phyllis Tickle who once shared that the church goes through a rummage sale every 500 years where they let go of the things that aren't working anymore so new and vibrant ministries can be birthed. Now, some in our world may say that this time feels apocalyptic. Maybe so. There may be an undercurrent of despair in our world, specifically in our country right now. And the collective mental health and peace of the soul is at a much lower baseline. I really don't know what our world will look like at Advent. I think most of us thought a few months ago that we would already be back to normal. Whatever that means. But the session, the staff and I, we all see this time as an opportunity. We are being bolder and more generous as we think outside of the box with our ministry and outreach. And we want all of you to be a part of that. This is what I know. Just like Moses, just like God told Moses, we have been here before. Maybe not us, the particular people alive today. Maybe not you and me. But the people of God have wandered to the far edge of the wilderness many times before to be surprised by God's generous provision and by God's challenging call for a different world. The God who calls out to us from beyond the wilderness is the God of our ancestors. We are part of a body that stretches across time and history and the globe, the long, long table of God from which we eat today. So in this next week, we are asking you, we're asking you to commit to a month-long spiritual journey of exploring our giving as individuals and as a church. Don't turn in your estimate of giving card right now. Commit to the process of exploration. Be curious. In the next week, we will be asking you why you give to Black Mountain Presbyterian. Don't be hesitant to share. We want to hear from everyone. Now, it might be easy, like Moses, to come up with responses to not answer or give of yourself. I'm tired of Zoom. I can't watch another online worship. The church isn't meeting my own spiritual needs anymore, so I might give to something else. But let's imagine a different way together. As one of our members on our generosity team shared with me, this is why she gives. Has everyone been fed? That is the question that is on the hearts and minds of everyone at BMPC. It is engraved on the communion table as a reminder of the mission of our church. 
Both members and strangers are fed literally, spiritually, and emotionally at BMPC. That is why she gives. That is why we give. So that Jesus' mission, which is the mission of BMPC, can continue. So maybe we can overhear this call to Moses as part of our call to a call to reject the mythic pretensions of empire, to restore the humanity to both the oppressed and the oppressors, to attend to the old work built into the muscle memory of our collective being. We may have had to wander to the far side of the wilderness in a place of breathless despair, we may at times feel displaced from the people that we love and the church and the institutions in which we are shaped. But just ahead, just ahead, there is a bush burning, flicking its flames in holy mischief, ready, ready to ignite our imaginations. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, you give us life each day, and we live in your presence all of our days. Thank you for the gift of life, for all the joys of living, for comfortable homes, for safety in our town and in our land, for healthy food from your rich soil, clean air and water, for friends for family, for neighbors. And as we strive to live in harmony, we thank you for the blessings of this life and that they may abound. We are thankful for your teachings, your word, your presence and your constant love, and for your incarnation in your creation and in each of us, and in the transforming power of your love in Christ. Today we live with the question of how we may give. How may we give when we feel depleted? How may we give when there's so many needs? How may we give when lives are in peril? 
Lord, help us to trust your way that in giving we may find new life and give new life, that we may participate in your way of love, your way of justice, your way of giving meaning and holy purpose. Please join me now as we humbly pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go Oppressed oh, so hard they could not stand Let my people go Go down, Moses Way down in Egypt land Tell old Pharaoh To let my people go So Moses went to Egypt land, let my people go. He made old Pharaoh understand, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh. Let my people go.
Friends, as you go out into the world this day, may God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. May you go in peace this day to serve the Lord our God. Amen.